Okay, this is going to be video one for AP European Notes on Tuesday, November the 6th. Happy Election Day. Go out and vote if you can. Uh, we're going to pick up from where we were yesterday. Uh, we kind of were talking about how you're seeing big landowners now aggressively seeking profits, um, whereby the 1700s, 1800s, you're seeing mostly just uh, most of the land being owned by a minority of Scottish and English landholders. Um, who are going to hire on or lease out farmland to mid-sized farmers who then hire uh, landless farmers to work in those farms. So these guys are going to be working the farms much differently or much more dra drastically than before. To where before they kind of set their own paces, their own speed, but now they're having to work for these people and they work all day, six days a week. Um, they work for lower wages and because of new technology advancements, you don't really have the need for as many workers, which means you continue to have this issue of landless workers who need something to do. And so what you're seeing happen here in the 1700s, which is very key, is a lot of unemployment beginning to spread in the countryside. This is going to open up a lot of people to help participate in industrialization, which more on that soon. Then you have this term on the screen, pro proletarianization. Proletarianization uh, is a transformation of large numbers of small peasant farmers into landless rural wage earners. Proletarization is the transformation of large numbers of small peasant farmers into landless rural wage earners. Um, that's the big transition that's taking place here, uh, especially in the 1700s, as you're having a lot of these people have been peasants, like their whole, their families for generations have been peasant farmers. And now with the enclosure system and everything else that's been happening, um, you're moving more towards them becoming industrial wage earners, which we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. Anyway, uh, England by far had the biggest transformation of this. So England by far went through this, the, like the earliest and the most, where they're going to have a lot of their people transfer to become more like this. Um, more countries will do this more in the later, 18, later 1700s and more in the 1800s. Okay, population explosion, which is where we're going to be heading next. So another factor that changed life in the 1700s was the beginning of the population boom. Um, there was new challenges of like more mouths to feed and more to employ, and we, we're going to look at how that affects the economy. So you're seeing more mouths to feed, more people who need jobs. How will that affect Europe and the economy of Europe? So we're going to first look at the long-standing obstacles uh, to population growth. Long-standing obstacles to population growth. The Black Death had caused a sharp drop in population and food after 1350. So in 1350, you have a dramatic drop in, in um, food prices, uh, population as well, uh, because of the Black Death. It also created a big labor shortage. By the mid-1500s, Europe had returned to their pre-Black Death levels. So by the 1500s, midway through, their population had returned to their pre-Black Death numbers. But popula population growth outstripped the growth of production after 1500. So that's a big issue that one of the reasons why the population boom and these other issues, these other revolutions don't take place sooner is that the population growth outstripped the growth of production after 1500. There was less food, housing, fuel, etc. per person. So and in this time period, 1500s, there was less food, housing, fuel, etc. per person. And prices... Uh, were rising more rapidly than wages. So prices were rising more rapidly than wages. So prices were rising more rapidly than, than wages that time. Um, this was all ba made worse by the metals coming in from America. So when you have all this flooding in of Amer uh, metals from America, it's flooding the market and making a lot of the money that was there not as worth as much. And so prices are generally going up and you're seeing a lot of inflation take place. So as a result of all this occurring, the metals from America, as well as a shortage of food and, ha and housing and fuel and so forth, uh, and prices rising causing inflation, this led to what's called the Price Revolution. So in the 1500s into the 1600s, you have what's called the Price Revolution, where there's uneven levels of inflation, uneven levels of inflation, and Population figures stagnate or decline across Europe. So population figures stagnate or decline across Europe. And we kind of alluded to this some before, like in the 1600s, you're going to see population levels have been increasing, but they're going to kind of stagnate all of a sudden. 
around the early 1600s. That's a lot of things to like um, the Little Ice Age and those kind of things too. Fertil fertility and morality. Sorry, not morality. Fertility and mortality returned to a crude balance by the mid 1600s. So by the mid 1600s, you see in fertility and, mor or in mortality numbers begin to improve. Where population began to increase roughly about a half percent to one percent annually, so fertility and mortality rates got better by mid 1600s. Once you get done with like some major wars, like the Thirty Years' War, as well as famines and issues like that, in the um, Little Ice Age period, late 1500s, early 1600s, by mid 1600s, populations began to increase roughly a half percent to one percent annually. Here are the effects. So you have a, gro a growth rate of about 1% per yield can actually yield, yield large results over a long period of time. In 300 years, it can result in as many as 16 times more people. So if you have an annual 1% growth of the population, it can result over 300 years in 16 times more people as a result. In, 1600s, in the 1600s or the 17th century, much of your Europe experienced unusual cold and wet weather, going back to like the Little Ice Age. So in the 1600s, much of Europe experienced unusually cold and wet weather. This resulted in severe harvest failures and food shortages. This, this was an issue early on where you had severe harvest failures and food shortages. We also talked about a while back how that led to a lot of rioting. You have a lot of peasants who are very upset because there's a lack of food. Prices are high for the food that's available. So it results in a lot, of, a lot of peasants revolting in the early 1600s, which leads to things like the Thirty Years' War. Contagious disease also would ravage European populations periodically. So you also would occasionally have these diseases come through and just really damage a lot of European populations time period. And so you have disease spreading, you have famines, you have the, the climate being more severe with like a little ice, a little ice age. You also have more wars as a result, like a 30 years war, which also helps not only to kill people, but spread things like disease as well. Which this leads us to the new pattern of the 18th century. So long story short, kind of where you want to be at this point, understand in the 15, 1600s, you had a lot of issues where you might have um, prices go up, but wages not inclined to meet them. You might have population go up, and then you have like famines and wars that bring them down in the 1600s. So you don't have these working together. In the 1700s or in the 18th centuries when you're going to see the numbers finally kind of go up because of all these things begin to work together. So growth finally begins to happen in the 1700s uh, even though it's a bit uneven. Between 1700 and 1835, Europe's population will double. So between 1700 and 1835, European, the European population will double. The basic cause of European population increase as a whole was the decline in, in mortality. So the basic cause of European population increasing was the decline in mortality, meaning that people didn't die as quickly. So there's something happening or some things that are happening in the 1700s that are decreasing the, um, the need or the reasonings for people to die as soon as they're dying. And we actually have five main reasons we're just going to go through real quick, and that's where we're going to stop this first video. So reason number one. One reason was the still unexplained disappearance of the bubonic plague. So the bubonic plague hit heavy in the Black Death back in the 1350s-ish time period, but it never really went away. It came back and hit, had these little outbreaks every once in a while. The last major case of bubonic plague was in 1722. So the last big case of bubonic plague was in 1722. Um, and we don't, and hist historians don't really know why it stopped all of a sudden. One reason they think might have, it might have been the case is because countries begin to have stricter quarantine rules at port. So people and goods would be, have to be in quarantine at port for longer periods of time. That might have helped it, but that's, that's the best they can guess. Number two, medical advances didn't change or help that much, but there was one important development, which was the smallpox inoculation. So medical advances overall didn't dramatically change. But one important pr improvement was smallpox inoculation. The first time you saw successful smallpox, smallpox inoculation in Europe was in England in the 1720s. And we got the method from the Middle East. So they, built, they borrowed the method of inoculation from the Middle East around the same, uh, around the same time period. Um, but this is going to help take out a very impactful disease that kills thousands of people. Uh, third reason is uh, there was another positive change 
I'm sorry, another positive change was the improvement in sewage and water supply. So another positive change was the improvement in sewage and water supply. One of the big things that absolute monarchs would do in the 16, 1700s to make their country stronger was to try to clean up their streets, make their cities better. And so a big theme was to improve their water supply and sewer treatment systems, which of course would de 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 deplete a lot of disease being spread. It would lower like mosquito count, fly count, which helped carry diseases. So that's a big change there too. Number four, humans also started safeguarding their food supply, mainly thanks to better transportation. This also goes back to, the, to absolute state. So humans also started to safeguard their food supply, mainly thanks to transportation. Like we kind of hinted at yesterday, a lot of these people only barely grew enough food every year to survive on. So if anything happened, a famine or some kind of bad climate or whatever knocks their crop out, a lot of those folks are going to die. Well, in absolute states, those monarchs wanted to build a lot of good roads and canals. A lot, in those absolute states, those monarchs want to build a lot of good roads and canals to help you know, troop transport or transporting goods or supplies. But the biggest impact is that it helps to transport food. That now if you have an area that struggles with crop production or has issues with low food counts, they can get food to those areas a lot more efficiently, a lot more effectively uh, before people begin to die in large numbers. Before it might be hard to get to a rural area and now, now not so much. And the fifth and final reason is because agricultural production in the 16 and 1700s uh, was a major factor. They began to grow much better food. We already talked about that yesterday. Basically, the three uh, field, three year crop rotating system where they abandon the fallow and begin to grow crops that can replenish the soil nutrients like England and the, and the Dutch did, that's a huge factor because now you have no year where you're not producing goods. That's a huge, huge factor. More food results in more people, more livestock. More livestock results in more meat, dairy, fertilizer, all that is a big impact as a result, especially certain crops. Like a lot of the crops they get from the Americas, like the potato, the potato especially, is huge because it becomes a very stable, easily grown crop that so many peasants can eat and use to live off of throughout the course of the year, even in winter months. So by the 1700s, the severity of things like famines, wars, disease, etc. had less effects. And so we're going to stop there. And you see here, like the chart, kind of how everybody's on the general increase. Uh, Russia's on a huge increase. France, Italy, England, they're all kind of increasing this time period. Here you kind of see it by the numbers as well, too. So we're going to stop. This is video one. We're going to pick up.